to the United Nations here in Vienna. And on behalf of my country, as well as the co-sponsors of this event, Belgium, Ghana and Switzerland, as well as the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, you know DC, the World Health Organization, WHO, and the civil society representatives of the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care, IAHPC, and Pallium India, allow me to welcome you to this event. One of the challenges of the 2019 ministerial declaration is to ensure access to and the availability of controlled substances for medical and scientific purposes, including for the relief of pain and suffering, and address existing barriers in this regard, including affordability. The purpose of this side event is to provide information on how we can meet our treaty obligations and ministerial declaration commitment to ensure the safe and affordable availability of internationally controlled essential medicines, especially oral morphine. Morphine is a necessary medicine for relieving moderate to severe pain. It is also key for treating severe breathlessness that is refractory to treatment of the underlying cause, especially at the end of life. Its medical uses spam multiple clinical settings in today's medical practice, including surgical care, cancer care, palliative care, emergency care, pediatric care, and long-term care. It is the most basic requirement for the provision of palliative care. Morphine must be available as an oral immediate release preparation and as an injectable preparation for any patient with moderate or severe pain. In that regard, safe and timely access to morphine is very important for public health. Still, this access is known to be concerningly inadequate in many countries especially in low- and middle-income countries. The World Health Organization, WHO, published in 2023 a new report on access to morphine for medical use, which describes how the global distribution of morphine as a vital pain medicine is unequal and does not fulfill the medical need. According to this report, access to morphine for medical use is influenced by many significant factors, including enablers related to good governance, reliable, efficient procurement, and supply processes, resource availability, and capacity building activities, along with barriers related to overly restrictive legislation and policies, inadequate service provision, and misinform misinformed attitudes and perception. For example, irregular supply of morphine and other strong opioids at health facilities due to limited financing were commonly noted as a barrier in low and middle income countries compared to high income countries. Moreover, unduly restrictive requirements could hamper patient access because they impede the supply flow or make prescribing and dispensing dif difficult for healthcare professionals. New approaches, including governance cover convenings focusing, focusing on impediments and enablers identified in the recent WHO report left behind in pain, are called for to resolve this issue and assist member states to reach target 3.8 of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Having said this, I have the honor to present to you here in person, as well as the people who are online connected, uh, Ms. Nell Van Tom, who is the Drug Policy Officer of the Ministry of Health of Belgium. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. 
I first of all would like to thank the permanent mission of El Salvador for organizing this important event that we are very proud to co-sponsor. Um, these awareness raising events remain necessary. Given the continued and significant imbalance in the uh, availability of controlled substances remains, that remains globally. The topic of access to and availability of controlled substances for medical and scientific use is an important topic for Belgium. And it was also at the core of our CND presidency. Together with UNODC, we support various projects in Africa, such as the Democratic Republic of Congo. In the framework of the INCB called for better data and more research, we also financed an exploratory study in 12 hospitals in Kinshasa, the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 2021, aimed at describing the availability of opioids and analgesics and to explore the experiences and the perceptions of healthcare workers, managers, patients and caregivers. We continue that study because this year we expanded the research on the availability of opioid analgesics for children. The results are expected in 2024. Also on the 14th and the 15th of November, we organized a panel discussion in Brussels that was dedicated to this topic. And we have drawn, amongst others, uh, the following important lessons uh, of these panel discussions. We are we are uh, we know that the importance of awareness raising training and on the job support remains very important. We also have learned that there is a need for more research, but also the implementation of specific clinical guidelines for different types of pain to improve the rational use of these controlled substances with a clear distinction between the needs of adults and the needs of children. We also need to reshape the narrative around these controlled substances containing opioids. Many challenges remain, and in order to accelerate our commitments towards 2029, we need to scale up our efforts. We welcome today's opportunity to discuss this very important topic, especially in the view of the upcoming midterm review, and we are looking forward to a very fruitful exchange. Thank you. I thank you, Mrs. Van Tom, for this declaration. I now give also the floor to Mr. Q San Tai, who is uh, the person, a technical officer at the Department of Health Products Policy and Standards of the WHO headquarters. Q was trained professionally as a pharmacist and health economist. Q was the project lead and principal writer of the 2023 WHO report, which name is Left Behind in Pain. Please, Q, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. Um, may I have the first slide, please? I think we are on the last slide. So, Excellencies, uh, uh, Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak with you. So in June this year, we WHO published a report to describe the extent and causes of global variations in access to morphine for medical use and actions to improve safe access. We have given this report a sobering title of Left Behind in Pain, which unfortunately is the sad reality of global access to morphine for medical use. Before I begin this presentation, I would like to acknowledge the generous contributions for numerous experts, some of them are with us today. Next slide, please. So the report begins by describing two crises related to the use of strong opiates. We know that in some high-income countries, they are facing significant harm and loss of life as a result of inappropriate use and overprescription combined with what the widespread availability of illicit, unregulated opiates such as fentanyl. The focus of the report is really on the second crisis, which, it, which is the, the fact that millions of people living in many parts of the world continue to suffer preventable pain as a result of a persistent lack of access to strong opiates such as morphine. Next slide, please. Next slide. So the report focused on morphine because it is 
the most basic essential medicines for the management of acute or chronic moderate to severe pain, particularly in the context of end of life care. It has been listed in the WHO model list of essential medicines since its very first edition in 1977, as well as the model list for children since its very first edition in 2007. Morphine is also less expensive than other derivative and synthetic opiates such as oxycodone and fentanyl, which has been associated with the opiate overdose epidemic in a few high-income countries. And we are aware that governments in these high-income countries have taken steps to mitigate the harms and also try to reverse the trends. What is concerning for this from this report is the fact that the persistently lack of actions and also lack of access to morphine. Next slide, please. So in, in this report, we have shown that less than 2.5% of the morphine produced globally was distributed to low income and lower middle income countries. As you can see from this chart, a significant proportion of the morphine produced were distributed to North America's and European countries, which and also a significant proportion of these countries are high income countries as indicated by the red bars at the very uh, right hand side of this chart. Next slide, please. We also know uh, from the data that lower income countries are much more dependent on morphine to meet the medical need of their population. As you can see from this chart, which tried to show the proportion of morphine to the total consumption of opiates, morphine accounted for more than half of the total consumption of opiates um, in a significant number of lower income, mid, lower middle income countries and low income countries, as indicated by the green markers, as well as some upper middle income countries, as indicated by the red markers. So what it means is that in the event of any disruption to supply, people in need of pain relief in these countries would be most vulnerable. So we must ensure continued and regular supply of morphine to these countries, including during emergency uh, situation. Next slide, please. The report presents a suite of enablers and barriers to access, uh, which are often the two sides of the same coins. For example, we know that good governance requires good regulations and policies. We know that good governance requires uh, some oversight from the medicines and therapeutic committees, as well as clinical supervision, formal audit and feedback. But we also know that when legislation and policy overly focus on preventing non-medical use, or when the administrative burdens are very high, it can actually present a significant barriers to access. We also know that predictable, stable, and adequate funding, as well as having adequate equipment, are essential to, um, to access. But we, we also observe that, that frequently in many countries, they don't have this component. And as a result of that, usually they have irregular availability, lack of awareness to the availability, or available when they are an affordable price. Um, in some countries, we know that you know, the services are centralized in the provision, and this may present a significant barriers to access, especially when patients have to travel long distances, uh, as this will become significantly problematic when there are poor transportation in these countries. The report also emphasized the importance of having a skilled workforce and providing training and also raising patient and public uh, awareness on um, the access to morphine. These are important to mitigate any uh, fear of the risk associated with the use of morphine, as well as uh, general stigma, as, as well as building trust with the general community. Next slide, please. The report presents five broad priority areas for actions categorized as improving access, skill set, awareness, governance, and resourcing. Of course, you know, different countries and health system will have different priorities as, as, and different barriers as well. The report presents this set of um, potential areas for actions really for the policymakers to consider in working with all the different stakeholders. We do want to emphasize that in taking actions to improve safe access to morphine, health and human rights must be at, at the center of all these policies. Next slide, please. At the WHO level, we have published various normative documents, including guidelines and other documents to improve safe access to medicines and health products, such as uh, for controlled medicines for pain. 
I just want to highlight that uh, next year, WHO will publish the revised guidelines on ensuring balanced national policies for access and safe use of controlled medicines, and we'll make that announcement when it becomes available. WHO remains committed to work with uh, member states, UNODC, INCB, Médecins Sans Frontières, and other international organizations, and importantly, with civil society in solving um, these access issues. Next slide, please. Before I conclude this presentation, I would like to emphasize that policy measures must be well informed and proportionate to risk. We acknowledge that some concerns about the potential harmful effects of opiates are valid, such as the potential to lead to opiate use disorder. And for this reason, as stated in the report, a certain amount of caution about potential harms of opiate use, such as when being used in non, uh, chronic non-cancer pain, is good for public health. But we also want to emphasize that such concerns should not undermine the benefits of open use when clinically indicated and when used safely by trained professionals. Next slide, please. In conjunction to the launch of the report, we have also published, uh, we have also commissioned three short films uh, to share stories from people impacted by access to morphine. We, we, this is a reminder to everyone that you know, um, behind our statistics and reports, there are actually people who will live through the experiences as a result of not having access to morphine and also the positive impacts it can bring to their life as a result of having access to morphine. So it, it is a reminder that our policies must be human centric. Next slide, please. I'd like to conclude this presentation by um, with the words of our Assistant Director General, uh, Dr. Yukiko Nakatani, who said in the foreword of the report uh, that leaving people in pain when effective medicines are available for pain management, especially in the context of end-of-life care, should be a cause of serious concern for policymakers. We must, therefore, urgently advocate for safe and timely access to morphine for those in medical need through balanced policy everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Q, for the interesting and very straightforward presentation. It was an excellent summary of the report uh, that the WHO has recently launched. Now, I give the floor to, uh, here in the room, to Ms. Giovanna Campello, who is the, lead, the head of the Prevention, Treatment and Rehabilitation, Rehabilitation Section of the UNODC since 2016. And um, I have to say that Ms. Campello has more than 20 years of experience with the United Nations Office on drugs and crime in supporting the member states and stakeholders at all levels in improving their drug prevention response, applying and contributing to scientific evidence. Most notably in this context, she has led the publication of the International Standards of Drug Use Prevention in 2013 and the UNODC WHO second updated edition in 2018. Let's listen to Ms. Campello. Thank you, Madam Chair. You made me blush. <laughs> um, distinguished Excellencies and dear co-panelists and colleagues, um, let me start by stating how the International Drug Control Convention were created with very clear public health goals, aiming to safeguard health and well-being by availing the use of controlled narcotics and psychotropics exclusively for medical and scientific purposes. And as we, some of my distinguished panelists have already mentioned, and how you find also in this beautiful document that uh, Catherine will in, in introduce uh, after me, and I was um, also uh, reading a little bit on the side, it is the responsibility and commitment of the member states to ensure the correct implementation of the International Drug Convention by developing legislation and regulations that positively shape 
the availability of and access to control medicines. But unfortunately, as we have heard, and uh, um, as we uh, we will be discussing even tomorrow, uh, regardless of legal frameworks and international communities' efforts, significant inequalities exist in the worldwide consumption or availability of medication, most notably uh, morphine, for the treatment of pain linked to various conditions. Uh, cancer-related, palliative care, HIV AIDS. But in addition, we should not forget that this is also the case with other medical condition and with other medications such as mental health disorder, neurological conditions and opioid use disorders. And also in the case of uh, management of pain for the management of the healthy population that is undergoing acute medical circumstances that may require them as part of procedures in emergency rooms, intensive care units, post-operative care burdens, poly polytrauma. We often forget that uh, such medication are also used not in uh, um, terminal uh, conditions. And we know also because um, uh, my dear colleague from the WHO has so eloquently um, uh, described that um, there are many challenges and barriers. Um, often the mirror image, mirror image of, of um, uh, enabling um, environments. But in terms of challenges, we can think about over restrictive legislation and policies, limited capacity in healthcare systems resulting in low coverage, an insufficient or inefficient supply chain that sometimes results in issues of affordability and the lack of awareness, some stigma and negative cultural attitudes towards the use of controlled medicines. None of us, um, I'm, I'm reminding us of these barriers once again, because I think that it's important to note that none of us can address these barriers alone. And that is why I would like to thank the organizer of this event and my co-panelists and all of you for bringing on board once again a large number of diverse parties with this common goal. And we need more. Um, since 2013, together with many of you, the joint UNODC WHO Union for International Cancer Control Program on Ensuring Access to Control Medicines while preventing diversion and non-medical use. As you can see, we are not renowned for the uh, for short titles, but our program has been raising awareness globally about the need for urgent action among the international community. And we have been able to concretely support some key member states. But this year, UNODC has been undertaking a wide range of consultation with many of you involved with a view to restructuring the program in response to the current global situations, the concerns and needs of member states, especially low and middle income countries that do require affordable, adequate and safe access to control medicines. I can already say that innovation and digitalization will be at the core of the program. As you know, DC will support member states to develop monitoring and reporting system, as well as rational control systems that would not limit access to control medicine, yet mitigate associated risk. In terms of capacity building activities, um, UNODC will focus on engaging early career professionals, including doctors and healthcare providers, through the establishment of network of early career doctors. The network will aim at raising awareness about risks associated with control medicines, enhance education on page management strategies, sharing tools to assess patients at risk, enhance rational prescription practices, advocacy, and intergenerational communication among senior and young doctors to discuss, to discuss traditional and emerging challenges, as well as sharing the latest evidence-based intervention. As you can see, we have really high, high hopes to, uh, for these kind of networks, because our the ultimate goal of engaging early career doctors is indeed to ensure availability of and access to control medicines while preventing diversion and non-medical use, but above all to do so sustainably and in the long term. As I mentioned before, UNODC has been operating in key countries to address their specific needs, 
And these countries are in various regions globally. And it, it has become evident to us how at least some of the issue affecting issues, pardon, affecting availability and access, for example, procurement affordability can directly benefit from a regional approach. So UNODC in this sense is committed to work at the regional level with all relevant stakeholders, the regulatory authorities, civil society organizations, our sister international organization and production entities and so on to address these barriers and significantly increase access to affordable pain medication to start with. Finally, Honourable Chair, fellow panelists and delegates, let me conclude by observing how embracing the shared responsibility to the global drug problem should not lead to a disregard for the national duty of ensuring access to controlled medicines to meet the needs of the population. The responsibility of providing access to controlled medicine is fundamentally a national obligation, and it does come with financial challenges that require international solidarity and support. As international community failing to uphold the commitments specified in the conventions signifies a failure, a failure to the fundamental human rights responsibilities and calls for our urgent action to support the most vulnerable individual who are suffering in pain. And being with all of you today here gives me a lot of hope to be able to finally expand, be able to finally expand our collective impact on this situation. Thank you. I thank you, Ms. Campello. And now we're going back to our video um, a video presentation. I now give the floor to Dr. Raja Gopal, who is the founder and chairman of Pallium India, which is a charitable trust fund formed in 2003, aimed at providing palliative care and effective pain relief for patients in India. Please, Dr. Raja Gopal, I give you the floor. <clears throat> Uh, I hope I am audible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I do feel very grateful to you for uh, the opportunity to address you all. I bring you greetings from India, where, unfortunately, more than 96% of the population needing pain relief are left behind in pain. That's bad. But there is something that makes it even worse. When there is access to opioid substances of step three of the World Health Organization's ladder, sadly, much too often, the inexpensive oral morphine is not available or prescribed. <clears throat> Those institutions where it's not prescribed use transdermal fentanyl as a first line drug. Now, this is in the context of the catastrophic health expenditure which plagues the medical world, particularly low and middle income countries. In our country alone, 55 million people are driven below poverty line every year by catastrophic health expenditure. The impact of using fentanyl instead of for more immediate release morphine is very obvious. For us, fentanyl, transdermal fentanyl is 12 times more expensive than immediate release morphine. And it's not even as if it's a superior drug for pain management in all contexts. For somebody in excruciating pain, it takes too long to act, whereas morphine would be effective in less than one hour immediately. Here it takes 24 hours, and it is not a good drug for initial titration of uh, morphine against pain. Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, we need to put a stop to this. We need to shout from the rooftops that immediate release morphine should be available 
before any country or any medical establishment makes more expensive opioids available <clears throat> palim india the organization that i am associated with and international association for hospice and palliative care have worked collaborated with many organizations nationally and internationally and agreed on this morphine manifesto which is making precisely that declaration that no country has an ethical right no country no medical institution has an ethical right to make available expensive opioids without making immediate release morphine available uh, ladies and gentlemen we must all work towards justice for those who are suffering those who are left behind in pain i'm very grateful to catherine petters my friend for, for taking it upon herself to be available and present at this meeting personally and to speak on behalf of everybody who worked together to create the manifesto to feel the pain of those millions of people and to endorse it catherine thank you very much and everyone thank you for listening to me i'll hand this back to you let us work towards making this world a little bit a bit a better place thank you thank you i thank you dr raja kopal for your statement as well as your comments in this important matter i now give the floor to Dr. Catherine Petus, who is the Senior Advocacy and Partnership Director for the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care, IAHPZ. Um, Dr. Petus attends UN organization meetings to advocate for improved availability and rational use of opioids for palliative care as a component of their right to health. She addresses issues of global palliative care development and policy as an essential element of universal health coverage throughout the life course. Her focus is equitable inclusion of those at the peripheries, such as failed older persons, prisoners, persons living with disabilities, indigenous persons, and those affected by humanitarian emergencies. Please, Dr. Petus, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Ambassador, and thank you everybody for being here. Um, <clears throat> and thanks, Dr. Raj, for um, working with us and allowing us to work with you on the Morphine Manifesto, which if you haven't got one there on the table, I'm not gonna read it because um, I don't have enough time, but you can all read it. Basically what it does is it, it goes through the normative framework that we all know, and it talks about these issues of pricing and the fact as, as Dr. Q from WHO said, and Dr. Raj said, that the, the really expensive brand name opioids, what I call in, in my work, the designer opioids are much more expensive and much more unaffordable. Whereas morphine, which is generic and, and what has been called the gold standard of pain management at WHO is not available. And often as my presentation will show is much more um, unaffordable in low income countries. So, um, and thank you, Giovanna, for mentioning the fact that morphine is very necessary also for the healthy population, not just for the palliative care and dying population. The, the two times I desperately needed morphine were after surgery. Um, when I had a, a very bad fracture, it was actually during the um, Haiti earthquake, so I think that was 2010. And I, I was in hospital for a few days in, in the United States and I had surgery and it was incredibly painful. And I actually was lucky enough to have a morphine pump. So I could, when I needed it, I could just use what I wanted. And then we were watching on television 
the Haiti earthquake, and they had absolutely no controlled medicines during that situation, and people were operating and and treating people with with no morphine, and it was just like I was so incredibly grateful. And the other time I I needed it was after I had surgery. So it it is not just for palliative care, even though that's what I happen to advocate for. So I also wanted to thank the governments of Belgium and El Salvador and Switzerland and Ghana. Um, They're not here yet because I know there's some other side events going on at the moment for co-sponsoring this side event and for their support for this work. So I'm going to talk very briefly about the Opioid Price Watch which is a research project of our organization, the International Association for Palliative Care. And palliative care workers across the world were invited to participate because we're a global organization. We have members in more than 100 countries. Uh, So they were invited to participate in data collection on availability of morphine in their countries. And surveys were sent, next slide please, electronically to interested informants. Um, who were then asked to identify an outpatient pharmacy, uh, click, click, uh, please, uh, that serves those with life-threatening conditions in their countries. So uh, there's several articles that have been published on this that are open access in the journals, and they were asked to report on the availability of different opioid formulations, the smallest selling dose, so they just had two questions, and the price of each formulation. So these were people who literally went into a pharmacy in Cairo or in Mumbai or wherever, um, all over the city sometimes to find if there was even one pharmacy that stocked opioids. And this, um, these articles report on that. Next slide, Lolly, please. Um, so um, it's the last article that was published was in 2018. So it obviously needs to be updated um, since the prices have varied a little bit. But since all member states are obliged to track the prices of essential medicines, that's what essential medicines are because they're supposed to be in the public health system. And I believe that WHO also tracks the prices. Um, We're going to be able to bring it up to date soon. And this project, the Opioid Price Watch, is part of our official relations with WHO as non-state actors. So because I'm not doing this interactively and sharing my screen, um, I can't show you in real time how it works. But it's an interactive map that you can access on our website that displays some of the results. And the green dots show the locations where our informants, um, and of course, there's plenty of places we didn't have informants, but this is where we did, found morphine price for a 30-day course at 100 milligrams a day, which is a recommended um, dose um, median, not for particularly high or particularly low, but the green dots are where they found it, and a red dot indicates no availability of immediate solid immediate release solid oral morphine at all, according to the survey findings. So if you do the interactive thing on our website, clicking on the green dot, and that's you, you might not be able to see it because it's a bit small, but it shows that in Brasov, Romania, uh, a 30-day course of morphine is free to the patient. Next slide, please. But when the researcher clicks on the green dot for Mumbai, India, they will find there's a pharmacy that has it, but she'll find that a 30-day course of treatment at 100 milligrams a day is 86 US dollars. And that was in 2018, which is many times the basic minimum wage of an Indian person in that city. Yet in Jaipur, in another state, it's free. And in Kerala, it's also free where Dr. Raj works. And usually when it's free, it's the result of concerted civil society advocacy and work with political authorities. And the project found that monthly treatment costs of morphine, and that's what the morphine manifesto is really about, it's the costs, um, measured in the number of days wages of the lowest paid worker varies greatly. So they did this unique thing, the researchers, was to compare the price with the average daily wage 
In the Philippines, it's 29 times the daily wage. In India, 21 times. In Guatemala, basically what it means is that someone has to work for eight days to get one one day's dose of morphine. So you can read all about that, of course, in the journal articles, but the, the, the you get the picture that in low and middle income countries where the basic wages are so low, there's no affordability at all for normal people um, if they get really ill or are there in severe pain. Most people in the world, as I think we know, in these countries where morphine is available, is not available, live below the international poverty line indicating that the number of working days needed to pay for the cost may be higher than the results in this study and that pain treatment is only accessible to the few people who can afford it, which is vast inequity. Next slide, please, Lolly. And then here in Sierra Leone, there's no morphine available at all. Um, even though there's a hospice, which is Good Shepherd, I believe. So this woman must endure the pain of terminal breast cancer with medicines that are not recommended for treatment of severe pain, which is paracetamol um, or uh, tramadol, which um, is is not, it's used in mostly in, in high income countries. It's not a recommended medicine for um, severe pain. And in higher income countries, we are so blessed, as I said when I started, that we, our mothers and our grandmothers are not subject to this sort of agony. Uh, next slide, please. So the conclusions and recommendations of the Opioid Price Watch report are that opioids are usually more available and affordable in high income countries than in low income countries with a few exceptions. And that's where civil society has been really active, like in Uganda, Romania, and some Indian states. Uh, the government's healthcare administrators and pharmacists should ensure that opioids are available in local pharmacies, not just in the urban centers, as we heard from Q that they usually are, near to healthcare facilities which provide care for life-threatening conditions. And additional research is needed to identify the reasons behind some of the differences in prices among medications, especially those favoring what are called complex delivery mechanisms. And that's like fentanyl um, and, 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 and other kinds of mechanisms that aren't easy to use, for instance, at home. And we do know that the pharmaceutical industry provides subsidies to governments so that they will market and distribute the expensive medicines, whereas they don't produce and manufacture morphine because it's not affordable. So they can't make any profit from it. That's one of the reasons it's not so available, which means we need to go to different kinds of mechanisms, such as pooled procurement, regional procurement, and local manufacturing. So um, it's recommended um, in the UNGAS outcome document from 2016, chapter two, which has those seven paragraphs of operational recommendations that I was privileged to help work on during that time um, to member states. And there are many other guidelines which um, can be available for countries that want to improve availability. And of course, our organization, as well as UNODC, INCB and WHO, are all standing by to um, help on that. And the last slide, please, Lale. So the INCB map on the left <coughs> shows the global opioid consumption rates per country. The only region that can be considered a benchmark for balanced availability is Western Europe. That's the green area, the small one, which is also the benchmark for the Lancet project on pain and palliative care. But the white, purple, and light green areas show inadequate availability, and the red is considered overconsumption. So what you can see then is that the majority are undertreated and a minority are over-medicated. And people who live in the green regions now are blessed, but perhaps we are unaware of how blessed we are unless we've suffered terrible pain and had it relieved by health professionals. 
with access to the good morphine they can afford. And I believe that by raising awareness in events like this and cultivating gratitude for those blessings, we can generate the kind of political will and funding to turn the whole world green and make generation, generic um, medicines available worldwide as the green map shows. That's the way it should look. That would be equity. So thank you for the opportunity to share today and for your presence and commitment to this event. And I would just like to say before the very end that the last page of this hard copy of the Morphine Manifesto, which shows all the endorsements, were one that that was the the what happened a week ago. We've had hundreds of endorsements since then. And including today, we were very happy that the Vatican signed on the Pontifical Academy for Life um, endorsed it, and many, many individuals. But what we're going to be asking, we've got all the regional palliative care associations, as well as the national palliative care associations and the global palliative care associations, is that they're going to be using this for advocacy with the governments of member states of CND and WHO. So um, it's, it's not just going to be a PDF that's going to sit on somebody's desktop. It's going to be put to work. So thank you again. Thank you, Catherine, Dr. Petus, for this um, very touched presentation. Um, I guess you're right. I now give the floor to Dr. Irena Laska, who is here with us. Uh, she is the executive director of the Mary Potter Hospice in Corche, Albania. Uh, she has been involved in palliative care for 23 years. She is leading an interdisciplinary team of medical doctors, nurses, social workers, volunteers, financial officers, among others. And she is also a country leader and national trainer for uh, palliative care. She is also a member of National Working Group for Spread and Development of Palliative Care in the country, as well as a national advocate for palliative care and development of home-based care for patients with NCD. Faculty member at the nursing faculty, a bachelor and master level. Her continuous efforts have brought to the inclusion of palliative care as a mandatory subject in the nursing faculties in the country. So we are ready to listen to you. Please, Dr. Irena, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Thank you, the, the organizer, and thank you for introducing me. It's a great pleasure to be with you and to share my great work, very hard work, and my experience working with patients with incurable disease and uh, treat their pain and uh, advocate for them to use the opioids uh, for pain treatment and other medical reasons. Uh, I'm leading a group of medical uh, staff, uh, social worker working for uh, ensuring well-being of patients especially with cancer in the southeast part of the country of Albania. So uh, taking care for patients, making us being experts in their well-being and uh, their treatment of pain. Uh, most of our patients are suffering from terrible pain and most of them need opioids to, for pain management and other medical reasons. When I started working in palliative care since 23 years ago, I remember that uh, there was not any opioids used for pain treatment. I remember my father died because of brain cancer in terrible pain, and I didn't offer to him something to, to ensure their, uh, his well-being, to make him sleep or be quiet and talk with me or with my mom for a while. So I remember it. And uh, I'm thinking all the time that if there are doctors and nurses and other policymakers, there is there are many things to do uh, to ensure patients' uh, well-being. So when I started working in palliative care, I remember what it was only some morphine prepared and mixed with uh, uh, diazepam together, but it was nothing. And from 
all these years, 20 years after, there are several uh, type of opioids used for a medical reason. There is morphine, tablets, oromorph, uh, injection. We are using fentanyl for pain treatment, uh, like a patch. We are using tramadol, codeine, and tramadol and codeine is uh, uh, it, uh, it is available in all the pharmacy without prescription, which sometimes is dangerous. And there are oxycodone used for pain treatment and uh, other medication. We have already methadone, but methadone is not using for um, as a pain uh, killer for patients suffering from severe pain. But uh, methadone is using only for uh, uh, addicted people who are using opioids for not medical reason. Uh, so regarding the using of opioids. Opioids are available for uh, or are prescribing from all the, the oncologists and palliative care doctors and GP. But uh, I wanted to let you know that the, uh, the, the opioids that we use for patients or let's say that the patients are taking as much morphine as they need to kill their pain, which is a very big achievement. And the... The good news in our country is that the prime minister is working hard to legalize uh, the pro uh, uh, producing opioids for medical reason. Uh, I heard Catherine was uh, telling us a story, her story, and I want to share with you. She remind me to to share a story with you regarding a friend of mine who was uh, who is working as police officer and he was the chief of uh, drug department. He did an accident and he did four surgery because he broke uh, four or five bones. And after the surgery, he had terrible pain. And no one of uh, the doctors asked him to use some morphine to treat his pain. And one day he asked me, he called me, I was on my holidays and he said, please Irene, help me because I can't sleep. I'm always crying because I feel in terrible pain. And I said, yes, we have something, you can use morphine. And he said, I have not any cancer, I'm not going to die, I want to live because I'm young. And uh, I know that I'll be addicted because I'm working and I know many addicted uh, people or some criminals who are selling the drugs and killing the young ones. And I'm saying, no, I said not. You'll be free of pain and you'll see. And after many, many talking, he started using morphine and he was so happy. And he said to me, please use me in your advocacy because I slept very well and it was a very a sweet sleep for me after such a terrible pain. So we have many ca cases like this, and uh, but our work is to prevent using of opioids for non-medical reason. We have some other examples in our daily work. I had a patient living, lived very near with my workplace and he had cancer, pancreatic cancer, and he was crying all the time when I used to go on to see uh, him at his home. And I started using morphine for him. And then he was saying to me that he was much quiet. He didn't feel any pain, but reading his face, I understood that it was not uh, any morphine used there. So one day I asked him to tell me the upper arm to see the, the place that he used taking morphine and I didn't see anything, any signs here. And he said, no, no, I'm not taking morphine here. I'm taking morphine uh, by my gluteus. And I said, I need to see your gluteus because it's my job. And he said, I'm shy. I can't tell you, show you all the place, all the all my body. And I said, it's uh, our job to see you everywhere and to do the best for you. And I didn't see anything. And we stopped giving morphine to him. And uh, we had a meeting with the, the only one healthcare insurance institute in the country. And we asked them to tell all the GP not give morphine to these patients. And two weeks after, we heard on television that the police station arrested his daughter 
and a friend of her because they use them they they sell the morphine to some youngest uh, children youngest people in their region so it's the, our task not only to to treat the pain of the patients, to look very well after their well-being, but it's a task to advocate for patients, to prevent using of opioids for non-medical reason, and to train other doctors and nurses. And we are preparing a very big uh, project now, doing a study for all the GP because uh, uh, now we have a young generation uh, doctors working in the primary health care, so they, they have not any idea regarding the opioids. So we need to do a study to discover the knowledge they have regarding the opioids and the, the pain treatment. And then we are preparing a very big project to train all the GP regarding pain treatment and using opioids. So uh, uh, using the opioids we know that it's the best way to treat the patient and to ensure their uh, their well-being. But uh, as uh, palliative care experts, we need to, to keep in our minds and to continue working, advocate it for making opioids available for all the people in need of them. Because in our country, as we as I said, we have the ability of opioids but they are using only for cancer patients. So it's our task to keep working and uh, ensuring availability for opioids to all the patients with severe pain. Maybe I went longer and I passed my time, but uh, yeah, thank you for listening to me and thank you for organizing such a very important meeting too. I thank you, Dr. Irena, for sharing with us uh, this information. And I now have the honor to give the floor to Mr. Eric Palacios, who is the Supervisor of Narcotic Drugs of the National Directorate of Medicines of El Salvador, my country. Please, Mr. Eric Palacios, I give you the floor to do your presentation online. Thank you. Thanks for giving me the floor today. Uh, well, I'm here today to share with you the online prescription system that we use in the Republic of El Salvador uh, to control medicines as narcotics, psychotropics, and chemical precursors. The system is powered by the National Directorate of Medicines. First, Let's begin with the online prescription cycle developed in the system. And so in the, in the DNN, we enable the doctors to prescribe online. Then they obtain the receipts for online prescription. And after that, they prepare the online prescription and they give it to the patient. Then he or she goes to the pharmacy where they can obtain the medicine just by showing their ID or by detailing the receipt number. After that, the pharmacy checks the information in their profile, and if it is correct, they give the medicine to the patient. All this cycle can be consulted at any time by the DNM. And if it is necessary, this information can be shared with other institutions that needed it. Well, in this case, and it includes the morphine tablets too, and in the other institution, we have the control of it. And how can a doctor get a profile in the system? And is it just necessary that they give us their ID and the current doctor's card? So going through the formation cycle step by step, and we have also shared how the doctor get a profile. And in the case of pharmacies, to obtain a profile, it is necessary that they provide information that shows that they meet the requirements to sell control medicines. And looking the overview in the screen that that is available to the doctors to make the pre prescription for the patients, we have, for example, the number of receipts, the name of the patient, and the medicine prescribed and the detail of the doses of the control medicine. 
Also, this system enables the doctors by the tools available on it to overview a lot of information that could be useful to make an appropriate prescription of narcotics or psychotropics to the patient. I'm going to start detailing that the doctors in the system can review the availability of different medicines with the same active ingredient, such as morphine. Like the image shown on the slide, where you can see that are five different brands of this after ingredient available in the country. There are ampoules and also tablets of morphine. Of morphine. In the next slide, I want to present to you one of more of the benefits that our system have. Uh, and the extent the doctors and also the DNM are available to review the history of, pre of prescription of a patient. I think that it could be useful showing to you the example that is in the slide, where we apply a filter and we can review the prescription of one patient who has been in treatment with oral morphine along 2023. This filter is useful for us also to review consumption of other control medicines and their pharmacovigilance. Besides, the system has more benefits. The one I'm, I'm going to describe now, I consider is the most important because it's good for the patients. They can always know where to get his control medicine and also the doctor can describe to him or her how to write to the pharmacy and ask for the medicine that she or he is needing. In this slide, I use one medicine containing the narcotic morphine. And after making the research, the system shows that there are many pharmacies that have the medication available and also shows the address of the establishment and the phone number. If you want to make any question, uh, before to go to the establishment and get your medication. In this case, in the slide shown a pharmacy that is far from our capital and also has availability of, of morphine. Well, continuing the cycle, once the patient goes to the pharmacy or as the establishment, it is possible to deliver it the pharmacy employees have a profile to review the information of the receipt. To do it, they just need the ID of the patient or the number of receipt. That has to be provided by the doctor before. If everything is okay with the receipt, the pharmacy delivers the medication to the patient. Besides the pharmacy profile in the system, has other benefits for them such as they can be reviewing their inventory at any time, and they also can make income or expense to the pharmacy inventory by the systems. Uh, they can make reports of any time, of any type by ordering the system to make an Excel document. And the most important thing is that they can know all the history of the pharmacy selling or delivering as you want it to call. Uh, the control medicines. As shown in this slide, I, there is an example for MST Continuous, that is a brand of morphine, and there is shown also an inventory of different control medicines. Also, I want to share with you that this entire prescription and dispensing cycle presented before uh, can be monitored by the DNM at any time with the user profile that is available for all the employees of DNM. This one allows us to track prescriptions by doctor, medication, patient, and in addition to this, we are allowed to limit the search for a certain period of time. Also, we can provide information if necessary to patients that need to know where they can get a control medication because their doctor forgot to give them this information. And I would not like to end my intervention without mentioning that these two have been useful for us to provide attention and follow up to different health alerts that involve medications that contain control medicines. 
And in this, in this way, uh, the DNM direct the tools to where it is required to give the timely follow up to a uh, help alert. And also talking about morphine, I would like to share with you that morphine tablets are used in all republic um, mainly for palliative care or to start treatment with opioids due to acute pain. However, we could mention that some of the limitations that exist for this access uh, to the general population is that the cost per tablet could be perceived as expensive for the population. But given this, uh, it's important to mention that in, in the Republic, there are morphine manufacturing laboratories that export morphine to, to Central America. Uh, but they're just producing by the time um, injectable pharmaceutical forms. So I think there could be an approachment between the government and these companies to increase the availability of morphine in tablets um, and possible the price could be more accessible for the patients who require it. And well, this is that I have to share with you today. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Palacios, for sharing with us the experience of El Salvador, especially the way we um, have the morphine and well, as well as how doctors and hospitals use this medication. Uh, well, we are ready now. We have finished the panelists, the nice and useful interventions that uh, were made by our panelists. And now we would like to open the floor if someone would raise a comment or a question, not only here in person in the room, but also online. If someone would like to ask something, please raise your hand. We and the panelists will be ready to answer your questions or listen to your comments. Everything is clear. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, please go ahead. There's no questions. I thought there was a hand online, no? Oh, they, they put it down. So I had a question for maybe Giovanna or for you, Madam Ambassador. Um, it's something I get asked quite a lot doing international advocacy for controlled medicines here because I've been doing it for about 12 years now is why are we at CND instead of at WHO because WHO does health and so why is it important to really do the heavy lifting here um I know what I think the answer is, but I'm really interested in what, why as a member state, you think that civil society advocacy is important. Because I have to explain it to our members that it's really important to do advocacy in Vienna, not just at Geneva, the Human Rights Council or WHO. Thank you. Well, I was not prepared to be asked <laughs> just to <laughs> listen to your questions. No, but um, I think the reason why is because uh, we all know, and actually uh, this side event is taking place on the margins of the CND, which is the Commission on Narcotics Drugs, um, part of the UNODC, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Uh, here is the place where the states, member states, decided to uh, adopt any policy on drugs. Um, here, uh, member states, uh, the level, of course, of member of the Commission on Narcotics Drugs, every year we have two meetings, an ordinary and an extraordinary meeting, like uh, the one that is going to start uh, the day after tomorrow on Thursday, and uh, the decisions, the resolutions on the matter are here, not only taking into account the health approach, which is in Geneva and done by the WHO, 
but here all the other matters related to drugs. Drugs is an, a holistic uh, issue matter that should be addressed not only on the social uh, health perspective, but also taking into account economic, social, political, security or safe issues. That's why it is important to have the NGOs doing an advocacy also here in Vienna. That's my point of view. But of course, I also see others. Uh, here is the colleague of Peru who would like also to make uh, uh, an additional comment. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Ambassador, and good afternoon to all of you colleagues and and dear friends. Uh, yes, uh, Ambassador, you were very right. And uh, uh, to complement what you have uh, said, uh, the access and availability of controlled substan substances is uh, one of the main uh, lines of the international drug conventions. So uh, CND is like the is like the UN body in charge of the I wouldn't say manage but in charge of to to uh, uh, is like the gatekeeper of the convention and works uh, works as a, as the secretariat very close to member states in order to uh, uh, try to get the best and full implementation of the convention in all of its aspects and one of these aspects is the access and availability that's the reason because every year we have uh, uh, the presentation of uh, uh, the world, world the the, uh, the committee of, of pharmacology. If I'm if I'm not wrong, the uh, committee expert on pharmacology of the world, world Health Organization, who presents to the CND a list of some substance to be uh, uh, added or reclassified. And uh, this, uh, uh, but this is not the only way. Member state also can. Uh, can suggest or propose the addition or reclassification of any substance. That's the case, for example, the, the most recent I remember is uh, the coca leaf uh, proposal made by Bolivia, which is now under evaluation of the uh, World, he World Health Organization Co Committee expert of on pharmacology. So uh, these are the like, and, and this has also the, uh, two uh, two lines of work, no? First, the first line is like the scientific, which is uh, uh, linked very close to the uh, expert committee of the World Health Organization. But in the end, the reclassification or addition is a political process that goes uh, that that happens every year in the in the CND in the main uh, in the main session of the CND in March. No? That's uh, that's my understanding of why you have to do this advocacy here, and uh, I must also say that the NGOs are very active here in the Vienna, in the Vienna-based uh, bodies of the UN, and um, I I am very happy to tell you that uh, we work very close with the uh, with the NGOs. Uh, many countries uh, here are part of the. the we have a. A group of friends of NGO, and we develop many different kinds of uh, of uh, joint works together in order to present to the CND, CCPCJ, UNTOC. So, if you maybe if you want more information on this, you can you can reach us, and we can we will be very happy to give you more information of what we are doing here. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you, Carlos. And. Um, I will uh, allow myself to add only a few words to the words of my member states who are our governing body. And in reality, I've already given you the basic uh, and, and most fundamental reason why uh, advocacy here is so important. But there are other reasons why we are so happy to have you and the advocates here at, at, uh, at in Vienna at, at every time. And it's something to do with the fact I'm often asked to justify why UNODC is involved. Why shouldn't just WHO leave me or, or, or INCB that works with the regulatory bodies? And for me, this is a bit of an analogy about this uh, in, in this discussion. 
in in the sense that to allow for con uh, access to control medicines is not only a matter of the health system, it's also a matter of the health system and of the regulatory body. But because it's interconnected with drug control, I think that one of the things of the other advantage of being all together, including with you and ODC, and, um, is that uh, we bring also our other stakeholders, particularly the control people who sometimes are those that are more concerned and 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 um, about possible diversion and non medical use and i think that in the few countries where by the way thanks to the uh, um to the uh, delegations of uh, belgium and australia that have helped us to actually be able to work at country level where our and the advantage was the power of convening everybody around the table. You know, health, regulatory bodies, drug control, the academics, the civil society, WHO, INCB, and really bring together their bridges and just take a, a very serious look at one situation and say, okay, what can we do together to, to solve this situation? And I think that's why I'm so happy that uh, not only WHO and INCB, and, but also the advocates from the civil society are constantly with us during CNT because it's only together that we can really make this change happen. We have achieved a lot. Let's not defeat ourselves. You know, 10 years ago, the, uh, the, the issue was not on the agenda as it is today. But now we need to really move it to another level in practice. Yeah. Thank you. I agree with you. Thank you so much. I see that we have a question. Ah, I, I, I will give you the floor next, but I see a lady in, in the screen. So please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairperson, and thank you, everybody, for excellent presentations. I suppose um, I have a, a question which, um, you know, like like uh, like the lady who just said um, 10 years ago, this was not on the agenda. So I'm hoping 10 years from now, this can be something we can work towards, given the disparities and the barriers that different countries experience. And like um, Q, very, uh, I mean, it was a great elucidation of those. I was just wondering, is it realistic at all to think about a future where we can have a global manufacturing and distribution system? Who would like to answer? <laughs> I cannot answer. I don't have a crystal ball. And for me, in the end, um, this the question presumes that that is, by definition, the most desirable state of affairs. And honestly, I'm not entirely sure that that is might might be the case. I was talking before about going looking at regional specificities and trying to at least build hubs and and solutions at regional level. I think we can start there. I don't know if we want to really go truly global. For me, anything that works would be would be the best solution and it might be that we we don't manage to go completely global all in one go and uh, just to say that what i would like to see is that in 10 years this is not on the agenda anymore but not because it has been forgotten but because we have solved the problem so let's try to work on that regional or global <laughs> thank you very much i also thank you for the question as well as the comment so please, I now give you the floor. Yes, thank you very much and thank you for this event. Uh, I'm Matej Koshira, I'm a chair of Vienna Angel Committee on Drugs. And as you know, uh, access to essential medicine is one of the key pillars also of our work at the Vienna Angel Committee on Drugs. And um, uh, we know, we organize uh, for the, on, in the preparation for the midterm review, we organize uh, different regional consultations. Uh, and we uh, already completed two of them in Asia Pacific region and in Africa. And those questions uh, came out of this uh, about the access to essential medicines. Uh, they came out of these discussions as well. So it's not only relevant to advocate for these uh, issues uh, in Vienna at the global level, but also at the regional and uh, the national level. So it's important to increase uh, uh, these uh, activities also not just at global, but also going down to, to the national and regional uh, bodies and uh, policymakers. Uh, and um, 
uh, as I said, I'm really happy for this event, and uh, I can say that we are also happy to co-sponsor this event. Uh, I think it was not mentioned, so it, we we are happy to co-sponsor this event, and we will continue to support this uh, these activities and efforts uh, to get a better picture, the green world at the end. I don't know in ten de in ten years to get this green uh, green world uh, with uh, available. Uh, essential medicines for everybody needed. Thank you. Thank you very much. And sorry for not including you in the list of co-sponsors, but I guess the work as a co-sponsor starts here. Now we have heard many things and this is our time to share all the comments, but thank you so much. Uh, does anybody else have a question or a comment? I don't see anybody. So uh, we are almost done, uh, and I know that at three we have still the technical consultations in the fourth floor, so I will now close uh, this event. Um, many thanks to all of you who are here present in the room, as well as all the people who are online. Thank you for attending this uh, uh, event as well as for your comments and questions. I would also like to thank all panelists for sharing with us relevant and useful information on the importance of ensuring the safe and affordable availability of internationally controlled essential medicines, especially oral morphine. I don't want to extend this event, but I found very um, relevant with uh, the phrase that was uh, showed in the presentation uh, done by Dr. Q. And I would like to close um, quoting this. And this is a phrase said by Yukiko Nakatani, who is the Assistant Director General of Medicines and Health Products. And she said, leaving people in pain when effective medicines are available for pain management, especially in the context of end-of-life care, should be a cause of serious concern for policy makers. We must therefore urgently advocate for safe and timely access to morphine for those in medical need through balanced policy everywhere. Um, I guess this is very relevant in I guess, as we, heard, as, as we have heard today, um, there are available options and tools to work together, as it was mentioned. There are different agents, important actors in the different sectors and areas that are available to also help us to assist countries in case it is needed. I guess it is important to remember that is our commitment, but also our responsibility to ensure the availability of these important medicines in life for people. So uh, there is no excuse, and I think that we should start to do it right now, today. So let's do it. Thank you so much, and have a nice afternoon, as well as very useful thematic discussions. Thank you.